President Trump last night touting the successful return of three Americans held captive in North Korea. But those hostages came out with respect. We didn't pay for them. They came out for nothing. And the others came out for $1.8 billion in cash. Can you believe that? It is a stark contrast, mind you, from the Obama administration's policy of paying for the return of U.S. citizens. In 2011, President Obama paid $1.5 million for three American hikers held in Iran. 2014, he swapped five Taliban terrorists for Private Bo Bergdahl. And in 2016, he spent nearly $1.8 billion in cash, as the president mentioned, for Iran, to Iran, for five Americans in advance of the disastrous Iran deal. Joining me now to talk about it, Gordon Chang, Daily Beast contributor, author of Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World. Gordon, great to see you. Um, I could have sworn it was a longstanding stating, stated policy of the American government not to pay ransom to terrorists or terrorist nations, but Obama did it anyway. Well, sure. And, and clearly, the point here is that we're just giving incentives to the Iranians, North Koreans, and others to just grab more Americans. You know, this policy has been violated so many times in the past. We really need to stop it. And it is progress that we did get the three Kims out of North Korea, and we didn't pay a cent to Kim Jong-un. That's real progress. Yet, uh, Chuck, I'd walk him out for uh, uh, Cameron Schumer, was on the Senate floor condemning the president for saying a simple thanks to Kim Jong-un for releasing them. I, is that just incredibly naive, if not dumb? I mean, what did he expect the president to do? insult uh, Kim Jong-un and threaten a historic summit to denuclearize uh, the Korean Peninsula? Yeah, the important point here, as you suggest, is that you don't want to insult Kim Jong-un on the eve of the meeting in Singapore June 12th. You know, I might not have said excellent, but nonetheless, I think what President Trump is trying to do is to sort of butter up Kim Jong-un. Sure. And if we can get them to disarm, to give up their nukes and ballistic missiles, return the Japanese abductees and do a few other things for a one-word adjective of excellent, right. yeah, then I'm all for it. Yeah. I mean, tell them... <laughs> Tell him he's got a nice-looking suit and a good haircut. I mean, you know, <laughs> lie to him. Um, yeah. And, gee, you look thinner these days. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about the upcoming summit in Singapore. Why Singapore? Is that a good idea? Yeah, Singapore is a very good idea. I think there's only one place on Earth that would be better, and that would be mar lago I actually like Mongolia. But the thing about Singapore is important is that it's not going to be in China because the Chinese want to claw their way back into the denuclearization process, and they've been a malign influence. And also, it's not in the demilitarized zone. Um, and that would be on the doorstep of North Korea, as President Trump's senior advisors have said. And it would feed the euphoria, continue the euphoria um, that South Koreans have over unification. Right. Um, on the surface, that's not bad. But when you start thinking about what Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president, wants to do, who's feeding that euphoria, it's actually undercutting the efforts of the international community to disarm Kim. So Singapore is a great place to hold the talks right. with the North Koreans. All right, look, you are the expert on North Korea. You've written books about it. Uh, you've lectured on it. We turn to you whenever the subject comes up. So here's the money question. Uh, how do you handicap Trump's success at the summit? I'm actually quite optimistic. I'm going to go out on a limb. And the reason is that this is not a Kim question. This is a question of whether President Trump will use the elements of American power to protect us and the international community. I actually think he will do it. You know, on Tuesday, he abrogated the Iran deal. He set himself a very high bar um, for success in North Korea. So, you know, if he were willing to just sort of accept any old deal from North Korea, which has happened too often in the past, then he would not have gone out of Iran. So I think that that's a sign that President Trump is actually going to hold the North Koreans to those big promises of giving up their nuclear weapons, which Kim made on April 27th to right. the South Korean president. And it seems that what he wants on the table from the United States is, is palatable. Um, you know, let's have an armistice, uh, or a, a treaty, actually, um, from the old... Uh, Korean War and just promise you're not going to attack us. That's doable, isn't it? 
Yeah, you know, that is what uh, Kim told Moon Jae-in uh, on April 27th during their summit. You know, if we had gotten to that point after five years of hard negotiations, we would have declared victory. Um, you know, but we're getting that before, you know, Trim, uh, Trump and, and Kim meet. And, and that's an indication. You know, I, I think Kim doesn't really want to do that. But the point is, Kim has now created a marker. President Trump can hold them to that. And that gives us a substantial up in the talks even before they begin. So I, I'm actually very happy about that. And I think that President Trump will use that to uh, make sure Kim it doesn't uh, doesn't play us. All right. So assuming for the moment he's not playing us, what changed? I mean, this is a guy who's firing missiles all over the place, developing nuclear weapons, uh, and he has some uh, nuclear weapons. And, and uh, his belligerence has all of a sudden been replaced by conciliation. Well, a couple things have changed. One of them is this U.S. And, and U.N. sanctions. Also, you know, we got to remember that Asia Korea watchers um, and, and clearly someone, Andre Lankov, who is considered to be the leading Korean uh, expert in the world, actually said uh, this was because the North Koreans, the Chinese and the South Koreans were afraid of war uh, in the peninsula. And so, therefore, they all changed their policies dramatically towards the end of last year, which means that Kim now feels he needs to come to terms with the United States. So, you know, that's the threats. That's Little Rocket Man, Fire and Fury, all the other comments that I didn't like then, um, but they seem to have worked. And, and it's not just us. It's, it's people in, in Asia who don't necessarily like Trump, but who are crediting Trump's policies in this regard. So, very quickly, all of the the critics of President Trump who condemned him uh, for provocative words or, or threats saying you're going to drive us to the precipice of a nuclear exchange with, with North Korea, in fact, it had the opposite effect. Well, it, it certainly did. Uh, and, and that is the universal view uh, or almost universal view among Korea watchers. So, yeah, the president's threats actually worked.